afternoon, everyone. Um, good day, if you're not in the afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. And welcome to um, this webinar that's been organized by PHM. Um, on the welcome page, uh, you'll see an advert for uh, another series of webinars that PHM is doing with Health Justice Initiative and African Alliance this month and in November. And I'll speak a little bit more about that. Um, at the end of the webinar, but for now, I want to welcome you. Um, my name is Lauren Paramour. I'm a, a member of PHM South Africa um, and very happy to have you here with us to spend the hour reflecting on um, lessons from the HIV AIDS struggle for the current struggle around access to COVID-19 vaccines, but also uh, therapeutics and, and diagnostics. Um, so I'm happy to have two activists, two female activists here with me um, presenting. Uh, the first is Sibongile Shabalala, who is a long-standing health activist and currently Deputy General Secretary of Tech. Um, and she's also Deputy Chairperson of the Gauteng Provincial AIDS Council. So welcome to Sibongile from Tech. Um, and of course, Treatment Action Campaign was instrumental in the struggle for access to antiretrovirals. And then also Kajal, who's a lawyer based in Delhi. She's been working on HIV, health and human rights issues for two decades. Um, and she has a special focus on trade and intellectual property and its impact on health in her work. So welcome also to Kajal. And uh, because we have an hour and we want some um, time for questions and exchange and comments at the end, I'm going to hand over to Sibongile immediately. Um, and she is going to be speaking to us about essential medicines and, and broken health systems, lessons from HIV AIDS struggles for the current struggle on C19 vaccines. So, Simongile, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Lauren. Um, maybe a few corrections. I'm now the chairperson, national chairperson of Treatment Action Campaign uh, and also serving at the national. Uh, South African National AIDS Council and the PHIV sector as the this session. It's always mm -hmm. great to talk about where we are coming from. Oh, God. I hope my network is okay. Uh, it's always wonderful to talk about where we are coming from and where are we now, because uh, most of the time history teaches us where we are coming from and how to do things better in a time where we are in. I will talk to mostly access to medicine. I know most of the people, maybe they know the history of TAC and access to medicine. We all know that uh, TAC was launched in 1998, but there is low. we have had a long uh, road in access to ARVs and other uh, 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 medicines that are very essential in the country and uh, uh, even uh, nationwide. Um, we know that people were dying of HIV and we know that we needed an intervention as now we need intervention since people are dying of COVID in our era. But not only COVID, we are now talking COVID, we are now talking cancer, we are now talking uh, communicable diseases. Uh, from, TA, from the history of TAC, from 1999, we started to a work on access to treatment of which one of our matches, which was the significant match uh, in Paraquana uh, 1999 match, where we were calling for PMTCT program to be implemented in the country, which we were calling also for nevarapin to be given to pregnant mothers. And that a, a, a struggle, it was not an easy struggle because it took us about two years for, for, for a court in South Africa, constitutional court, to, to force or a, a, a force government, yes, to, 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 to provide never a pin uh, to pregnant women. 
We also have another case, the fluconazole uh, 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 in defense of Pfizer patent. We know that patent always blocks access to treatment as now we are talking of tra cancer treatment. We've been seeing TAC in the past few years matching to different uh, pharmaceutical companies to say you cannot continue to charge high prices of cancer medicines like uh, 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 trastuzumab which is a breast cancer medication, uh, which is very expensive in, in, in South Africa, as much as now the government can be able to, to, to buy the, 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 the drug from the, the, the pharmaceutical companies, but still, it's still expensive because government has to make submissions to make sure that they get that drug. And even if you are uh, using a, a private sector, you can, we are unable to access it. Um, we started to see the rollout of, 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 of ARVs in 2004, uh, and it was very slow. And uh, as much as today, we are talking about high number of people uh, living with HIV being in, in, in initiated on treatment or are on ARVs. And as much as we are talking about that today, but we still have challenges uh, when it comes to HIV people, uh, HIV positive people accessing treatment. Uh, they asked me to talk about broken healthcare system. Now I will uh, focus on that to say today, I think you have seen uh, last month where TAC in Gauteng slept two days, spent four days and two nights outside the premier's office uh, demanding answers and commitment from the premier of Gauteng and the MEC of health in Gauteng. It is so embarrassing and disappointing to say even this time of the year or this time of age, we still have ignorant or leaders that do not have a political week in fixing the broken healthcare system. When we talk about the broken healthcare system, we know in, in Gauteng, uh, we, we had a tragedy in April where one of the hospitals and the largest hospitals that services cancer patients in South Africa, uh, it has been banned uh, because of poor maintenance. And that hospital, it took months for them to, 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 to renovate the hospital and open the hospital. But it was due to, it was due to, uh, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry about that, there's something that is disturbing me. It's due to, to un, uh, uh, not having a political will from uh, 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 the leaders in the province. But then I'm also want to focus of why the broken healthcare system is, is, is broken like this. As much as we had challenges and we know that uh, there's been uh, underutilized funding and people, uh, the Department of Health was not using the funding uh, accordingly. And we know that other service uh, providers were not paid in time because of the challenges that the Department of Health created because of cor corruption. As we are sitting with you today, we know that the, the former Minister of Health, uh, Zuelim Kiza, has, has resigned as the minister because he's running away from what he has done. He has stole about 150 million, uh, million with his family and friends. And that money was supposed to save his people on the ground. We are talking about shortage of human resource on the ground, which is still problematic, which makes more people not to be able to access services in facilities due to poor healthcare system. So as much as we are saying it's broken, actually the healthcare system in South Africa, it's not broken, it has collapsed. Because for a person to access services in the public sector, you have to spend the whole day in the facility. You have to wake up early in the morning around four o'clock and come back at home around half past two, half past three. What does that tell us? That our healthcare system has, has collapsed. I'm talking to you today uh, we, we know that we are always, uh, and we are just, we just finished Women's Month uh, in August, we are in Heritage Month, but we are celebrating all these months, calling them by names, while women are still struggling to have contraceptive, a mere contraceptive in South Africa, it's a problem. We've been facing the shortage of contraceptive since uh, ever in South Africa. It's not only this year, this, this challenge we've been uh, having it before we had COVID. Even today, we still have that problem. We still have shortages of ARVs in the country. We still have 
uh, 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 challenges of vaccines, especially the COVID-19 vaccines in other provinces like in Western Cape, the past few months, July, uh, early August, there were no vaccines and they had to run around borrowing vaccine from clinic to clinic in order to vaccinate people. And while we are stop, still talking about vaccine, it can it will be wrong for me not to talk about trips waiver, which it's problematic where the world now determines who's supposed to get the vaccine and they want to put it under patent. Uh, two weeks back, we were working with Africa Alliance uh, to, to push or put pressure on the Germany uh, embassy and to Germany to say they need to uh, uh, push for not to, to sign a trip waiver so that other countries can be able to access uh, 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 COVID-19 vaccines. We have lost millions of people due to COVID and we cannot now sit in here and pharmaceutical companies want to make money or make profit out of people's lives. We are saying uh, 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 no profit and, uh, 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 in, 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 uh, uh, in, in favor of people's lives. So the thought that we can talk about, but due to time, and we know that the discussion has to continue, I will stop there for now. Uh, but before I stop, uh, Lauren, you will, you will pardon me. You know what makes us to, to, to have the biggest program of ARVs today? It's because people were educated on the ground and we continue to do that. And when we talk about COVID-19, uh, we are not having much uh, 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 education that uh, we, we are giving to people. So it's up to everyone who have information to, 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 to give information to people on the ground. We are having people who are anti-vaccines because they are not informed. Only a myths and fake news are distributed, but right information, it's not uh, well distributed. And we need a simplified language like we did on ARVs. You can't expect people on the ground who are never went to university to understand SARS-CoV-2, what is that? And you, you, you saying you are giving people information. Yes, in South Africa, I have seen several times where Professor Slim, Professor Glenda Gray, they were ex have been trying to explain these uh, issues on, on, on non-national television, but that is not enough because the English is too deep. So we need to um, uh, simplify it so that we can be able to share this information to the people on the ground. I'll stop there for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sibongile. I think you've touched on many issues that we'll come back to. So the issue of uh, the collapsing public health system and the importance not only of having access to medicines, but also good management um, and also enough people working in the system, enough human resources to make the system work for the patients that come the issue of education and, and knowledge and our medicines, how they work and why it's important to take them. Um, and then, I mean, I, th I think one of the biggest points you make is that we're still struggling to get access to medicines because of the, um, the intellectual property rights uh, that make medicines expensive. And so that's across the board, cancer medicines, HIV medicines, um, diabetes, all sorts of things. So I'm going to uh, hand over to Kajo, and she's going to speak a bit more about the, the intellectual property side of things. And then uh, we'll come back for, for a more general discussion. Kajo? Great. Uh, thank you so much, Lauren uh, and Annalene and everyone at WHM South Africa for organizing this. Uh, thank you so much, Chairperson, for, for really setting us up for such an important uh, conversation on the larger picture of what's happening with, uh, with COVID. Uh, I'm going to do a more specific issue of just looking at what's happening with the issue of intellectual property rights and access to COVID-19 technologies and sort of what we've learned over the last year and a half. Uh, and I think the theme that I'm going to pick on is, is exactly what, what, what the chairperson, what Sibongile was talking about, and, and that is the power of big pharmaceutical companies um, that we have just seen explode uh, in the last year and a half. Um, so, yeah, let me just... Does that work? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so I haven't really figured out Zoom that well. So if there's a message, I'm, I normally can't read it. So if, if you want to interrupt me or just uh, tell me to finish or something like that, just, just interrupt me. Don't send me a message. I won't be able to see it. Okay. 
Um, so I thought I'd just try and uh, condense a little bit of what we've seen in the last uh, year and a half into, into what I call 10 plus one lessons uh, that we've seen from the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and what that should mean for the treatment access movement and, and, and very specifically on the issues for, for probably of intellectual property and the power of big pharmaceutical companies. Um, I wanted to take us back 20 years, actually, uh, because this year we mark one of the biggest victories that the Access to Medicines movement had uh, at the World Trade Organization in 2001. Uh, you know, I don't need to tell any of you this, you know that in 2001, we already had treatment for HIV. That treatment was not available. It was not in generic form. It was not affordable uh, because multinational pharmaceutical companies in the West held patents on, on them and we had no access to it. Uh, and on the left, I've got these really sharp cartoons that, that you know, had sort of come out of South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa as a Piro's cartoon on, on what Big Pharma is, you know, the third world genocide division, which I guess we can uh, go back to thinking about today. Um, and the fact that, you know, there was no access to this treatment, uh, even though it was available in 2001. And then you had South Africa, uh, the South African government amending its laws to ensure that there was access to generic treatment as it became available from Brazil, from Thailand and from India. Uh, and we know the history of that. They were, the South African government was promptly sued by 39 multinational pharmaceutical companies uh, for daring to try and access affordable generic medicines. And that set off this global movement against pharmaceutical companies and challenging the World Trade Organization uh, and it's TRIPS agreement, you know, that requires all our countries to grant 20-year patents on all products, including life-saving medicines. Um, and that global movement that started or that was sparked off from South Africa resulted in what we know as the Doha Declaration today. This is the 20th anniversary of the Doha Declaration that we'll be celebrating in a few months, uh, where every member of the WTO, including developed countries, said, uh, that when it comes to the TRIPS agreement, and that's the agreement that requires us to, you know, grant these patent monopolies on medicines, uh, that they should be interpreted in a manner that supports the, the right to health and in particular access to medicines for all. Uh, and the last 20 years of what the HIV movement has done globally has focused to a large extent on using this Doha Declaration. Many countries have issued compulsory licenses to ensure that they have access to cheaper medicines. In countries like mine in India, we regularly challenge patent applications that come in on, on, on essential medicines. And in South Africa, of course, you've had a nearly 10 decade long uh, uh, you know, law reform campaign going on in an attempt to get South Africa to also adopt and use what we call TRIPS flexibilities to ensure access to, to affordable medicines. Now, one of the things that happened in the last 20 years was, of course, that pharma pushed back massively against all this, against all our work on ensuring access to affordable medicines. But the one thing they always said was, yes, you have the right to take these actions if there's an emergency, okay? Um, and lo and behold, we have COVID-19. I don't think there's any other better definition of an emergency. And I've said this before, even someone as cynical as me, and I, I think I'm one of the most cynical people I know, even I believed Big Pharma when they said, if there was a genuine emergency, you would not have to think about patents, you would not have to think about intellectual property, there would be no question about being able to access life-saving medicines or vaccines. And here we are a year and a half later, and as Sibin Ila has pointed out, um, even that Big Pharma is not happy to, uh, to follow through on their promise, that even in the case of an emergency, they will put barriers. So I just wanted to highlight some of the things that we have learned. Okay, lesson one, in the HIV movement, we focused a lot on ARVs, on access to medicines. What COVID-19 has shown us is that there are intellectual property barriers on masks. Uh, many of you probably recognize this machine. It's the CBNAT machine, the gene expert machine from Cepheid, which is now used also for diagnosis of COVID-19 and they're refusing to share the technology and they're charging a lot of money for this test. They're not bringing the price down. Uh, and on the right-hand side, what you can see is the thousands and thousands of patents and patent applications uh, that previously already existed on coronavirus vaccines. And now we know in the last year and a half, many, many more have actually been filed. So we used to focus on medicines. We now know it's a lot more than medicines that we need to look at and focus on. Lesson number two, it's not just patents. Uh, this is something that we've got so used to working on in the last 20 years. But there's something else called trade secrets that is turning out to be even more dangerous. Uh, the simplest example that I can give you is, you know, the recipe of Coca-Cola. I think that's the most famous secret in the whole world, right? Nobody knows it other than a few people in the Coca-Cola company. Great for Coke. 
Uh, but when it comes to medicines and vaccines, when you keep the recipe and the formula of how to make medicines, how to make vaccines secret, it means that other competitors cannot do this. And that's really been one of the biggest holdups in vaccine manufacturing expanding across the world. Uh, I'm not going to spend time on the right-hand side. I'm sure these slides will be available to you later, but we're discovering more and more that there's many intellectual property barriers across the board when it comes to access to diagnostics, to masks, uh, to ventilators, uh, and to vaccines, of course. Lesson three, uh, the AIDS medicines voluntary licensing model does not work. Uh, and the example that I'm picking over here is of remdesivir. Uh, I want to start off by saying that it is not a good drug. Uh, the WHO has clearly said it does not work, and many of our countries are spending too much money and time and effort trying to access it. The reason I'm using it as an example is because it shows when what happens when you try and use voluntary licensing in the middle of a pandemic. When you have a global requirement for medicines, and you have one company, Gilead, deciding that a few companies in India, in Pakistan, in Egypt will make the medicines for 127 countries, what has happened is that the Indian companies can barely make enough of this drug for India alone, forget exporting it. Uh, we've had a black market actually evolve around it because there's not enough for India. So where will India export it to other countries? The second thing that's happened is that because there are fewer companies that are making it, the price of this treatment could be as low as $5 for a five-day course of treatment, but it has not gone below $250, right? And this is because we don't have mass production, we have very limited production. So the voluntary licensing model that we got used to in, in, the, in the AIDS context really is not working in the context of this pandemic or when there's global requirements. Lesson four, public funding, which we all demand and we all ask for and public promises do not equal access. Uh, the biggest example of this is the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. It came out of Oxford University. It came with public funding that the UK had put in. Uh, and yet, even though they said that, look, because it's a pandemic, anyone can come and take a license from us, anyone can make this vaccine, by the end of it, they ended up having a, an exclusive deal only with AstraZeneca. And even though AstraZeneca has empowered other companies to make it, again, we're not seeing mass production. Uh, and South Africa itself saw the problem in the delays uh, when they tried to access the AstraZeneca vaccine. This has, of course, happened with other vaccines as well. Lesson five, pandemic or no pandemic, always no transparency. Uh, we have no idea of the deals these companies have entered with our governments. We have no idea how they supply. We don't know what prices they're charging. They don't tell us when the supplies are going to come through. Uh, with the AstraZeneca one, there was a, a leaked uh, uh, contract that came out of Brazil. Uh, and then somebody finally managed to put together the prices that they were charging. AstraZeneca and Oxford said that they would have no profit pricing for their vaccine. Uh, but their prices ranged from $2 to $3, ironically for developed countries. And then a country like Uganda pays 7 to $8 for those. So we have no idea what's actually happening with these companies, their supply or their pricing. Lesson six, 100% profit, 0% responsibility. Uh, Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson are making billions of dollars on these vaccines, but they are forcing our governments to give them unqualified indemnity and immunity from any responsibility from the side effects from these vaccines. This is unheard of before this pandemic. You have this responsibility for a product. You are making billions of dollars on it, and yet they are forcing and bullying our countries into saying, if you want the vaccine, you will, you will make sure that we don't get sued for any problems with that vaccine. Uh, and this is a really shocking thing that's happened in the course of this, uh, this sort of pandemic. Lesson seven, uh, I think for 20 years, we have been told that local production is not possible. It's not possible in Africa. It's not possible in least developed countries. It's expensive. It's very difficult to do. And today we can see what the result of that is, of not being self-sufficient and self-sustainable in local production. It's also a lie and a myth that it is not possible. Before even the Indian companies made remdesivir, what you can see on the left-hand side of your screen is the announcement of a Bangladeshi company, and Bangladesh is a least developed country, which had already made remdesivir and was supplying it to their government. Okay, We've had vaccines come out of China, which have been validated by the WHO and are being used across the world. Right, So we know this is possible coming from uh, developing countries. We also know from research that our friends and colleagues are doing in the United States that with the mRNA vaccines, the ones that you know of as Pfizer or Moderna, uh, once they get the technology, manufacturers are actually able to start making and providing these vaccines within six months. So that's how quickly it could actually happen if everyone put their minds towards uh, you know, improving access and improving production of these vaccines. 
uh, one of my favorite uh, arguments that the pharmaceutical companies made against providing this technology globally was that if you had the TRIPS IP waiver that Subhangile was talking about, then China and Russia were going to get access to this mRNA technology, and that was going to cause a national security threat. Um, and then six months later, we hear that BioNTech is now entered into a joint venture with China and is going to be producing the mRNA vaccines in China. So apparently, if we assert our rights to get the mRNA technology, it's a national security issue. But if they hand it over and make profits from it, uh, you know, then it's not a problem. Uh, lesson eight, our governments definitely have the power to challenge big farmers' monopolies. Israel has issued a compulsory license on Ritonavir, Ritonavir, which benefited the HIV community more than those who needed COVID treatment. Hungary and Russia have issued compulsory licenses. Many countries, including developed countries, have changed their laws, but unfortunately are simply not using that power because they are afraid of, of pharmaceutical companies. So lesson nine, and this is something we know from the HIV movement, our governments are not going to take on big pharma. So it is up to us to do it. Uh, groups in India, in Argentina, in Thailand have already started challenging patent applications on COVID-19 drugs like remdesivir and fibrofiravir, and hopefully we're going to start seeing challenges coming to the vaccine patents as well uh, in a bit to open up, up production. Uh, so there's multiple campaigns, and I think many of you on the call are actually part of these campaigns, so I'm not going to go through them, uh, but there's the People's Vaccine Campaign, there's the TRIPS Waiver Campaign, uh, and the International Treatment Preparedness Coalition is currently running a campaign asking if we should rethink TRIPS, if TRIPS should be abolished completely uh, so that we have no monopolies on essential medicines, vaccines, and other health technologies. There are counter campaigns, of course. Pharma is spending a lot of money lobbying against the TRIPS waiver. Uh, the WTO, which, you know, ideally should also be taking the lead on this, is going round and round in circles, just holding meetings with pharma companies, and it's not going anywhere. And I know it's very controversial for me to put COVAX as a counter campaign, uh, but I let the special envoy of Africa explain, and I'm going to use his words to explain why, why that, that's the case. Uh, the African Union special envoy strike, Masiwa, said that if there was ever an inquiry into how vaccines have been distributed, that COVAX would be found culpable because we were misled. We were led down the garden path. We got to December believing that the whole world was coming together to purchase vaccines, not knowing that we had been corralled into a little corner while others ran off and secured supplies. So the people who bought the vaccines and those who sold them the vaccines knew that there would be nothing for us. If you remember when COVAX was set up, the developed countries were the ones saying, we're going to fully fund this. This is the way we're all going to get access. And what were they doing in the meantime? They were buying up all the supply. So for me, COVAX is a counter campaign against the right of countries to access vaccines on their own terms. Lesson 10, it's not just about COVID, and this is something that Sidney Law also said, we have a massive impending non-COVID health crisis. Uh, we have gone back years on TB, on HIV as well, and on other health crises, and the medicines and treatment for those diseases are also extremely expensive, and they are patented. So we're going to see a crisis across the board with these intellectual property barriers. My last point, uh, lesson plus one, is that as the access to medicines movement, I think we need to introspect as well. Uh, I was interviewing Mark Haywood uh, a few months earlier, and we were discussing the 20th anniversary of the Doha Declaration. Uh, and I found what he was saying quite uh, powerful, so I'm just going to read from him, from what he said. Uh, when he was talking about 2001 and the treatment action campaign and going out on the streets and challenging pharma, uh, he said, we catalyzed a movement across the world that over five years put some of the most powerful companies in the world on the defensive. They were being shamed, they were pariahs morally, and it culminated in the Doha Declaration. But governments didn't use the power that activists won for them. And as activists, we have to be self-critical. Not immediately after 2001, but probably around 2008, 2009, the activist movements let the pharmaceutical companies off the hook. These companies reconsolidated, they reorganized, they ate up generic companies, they worked with developed countries to put the squeeze on developing countries. And then when we wake up to the COVID-19 epidemic, suddenly the whole world can see what is happening with the productions of medicines and vaccines. And the lessons from the HIV movement don't seem to have been learned. Pharma companies around COVID-19 are behaving so brazenly, so unashamedly in exercising their sovereign power over countries that it's breathtaking. Uh, and I think Mark's words really tell us about where we need to introspect as a movement of how have we contributed to this power of big pharma being consolidated. Um, as Sibigila said, it is only the powers of community that can challenge pharma. It is not our governments. Uh, and that last photograph on the side that you see is this morning, uh, our, our dinosaurs of the HIV access movement activists, uh, Greg Gonzalez, Peter Staley, uh, taking a pile of bones and skulls 
uh, to the chief of staff of the Biden administration demanding action against vaccine inequity and for the sharing of, of vaccine technology across the world. Um, we know that this is actually the only thing that works. And I will end in the words of, of uh, Amit Sen Gupta from the People's Health Movement, who said that the struggle for health is a struggle for a more caring world. And I think that we are here to build a more caring world. I think we are looking at an extremely uncaring world at the moment, and it is our job as communities and activists to get the world back on the right track. So thanks so much, BHM, uh, for organizing this, uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Kajo. I um, am really struck by the, the quote at the end, which is about building a more caring world, and it also makes me think of um, the Oxfam report that was released last year, which I think was entitled The Time to Care, which focuses on, on women's social reproduction labor. So the work that goes into cooking, cleaning, looking after children, um, looking after sick people in the household. Uh, and of course that's done unpaid every day, but also poorly paid if we look at um, community health workers, for example, in, in South Africa and many other parts of the world that work of caring isn't really um, appreciated. Um, and, and perhaps that's one of the things also to think about in, in terms of caring, building a more caring world. Um, okay, so um, I can see Demisile has posted a, a question in the chat. Demisile, I don't know if you want to put your mic on, um, otherwise I can read. Um, but as it displays in the chat, the question says, Stack has done a lot of work. Um, but the current situation is that um, the country is facing the greedy, lead, greedy leaders within government. Um, and, and then in terms of tax response to that uh, greed and, and corruption within government, um, how is that planning to address that? Um, the second question is about something Sibongile also mentioned, which is the question of education. Uh, what are the lessons um, that tech has to share about uh, vaccine education and, and how do the, the HIV AIDS lessons help us to do better education around vaccine hesitancy now. Um, and then there's a final question about um, how is the progress of injection. So I think the final question, I'm not sure, and Demisile, you can correct me, I think the final question is around um, maybe new medicines, so medicines that don't necessarily re require daily ARV uh, tablets to be taken. Um, but I'm not sure about that last question, whether I'm interpreting it correctly. Um, so yeah, let me let me start with you, Sibongile, about the question around health systems and, and corrupt leadership. Um, and then the other question, which is about lessons from the HIV mobilization movement uh, for education around vaccines. I'm trying to see maybe I think we may have lost Sibongile because I don't see her on the participants list so maybe while we wait for her to come into the room I can ask Kajo a question if she doesn't mind um, so so one of the things you say, Kajal, is that uh, you know we can't um, we can't rely on our governments. We need uh, to have popular mobilization around access to medicines. So there there is a suggestion being debated um, that we should have a pandemic treaty, uh, and that a, a kind of new legal framework that says, okay, when we really 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 have an emergency then we'll have this pandemic treaty and then that treaty will say for sure trips will be suspended and for sure everyone will have equitable access to medicines. Um, so, so let me ask you, what's, what's your take on it? Do you think that's a, a feasible response or you're not so convinced or it can work if we mobilize? What do you think? Um, I, it's, it's difficult to respond to that in any positive way at the moment. You know, I think for, for those of us who've attended health meetings and conferences over the last 10 years, I think every single meeting that I went to had a WHO uh, sponsored session on, on pandemics. 
uh, there was always a side meeting. There was always discussions that, you know, we're, we're, we're waiting for the next pandemic. I think they were expecting it to be something more like the influenza and, and not the coronavirus. Uh, but there have been discussions on this for the last 10 years. And uh, it turns out that the plan was that there was no plan, um, you know, by the end of it. Because if you remember in the first uh, three to six months, uh, even the institutions were scrambling and nobody knew what to do. So after 10 years of having heard this pandemic preparedness discussion going on, uh, it seems that there was actually no plan. Uh, so this pandemic treaty conversation has been going around. I think it's something that we have to watch very, very closely um, because if we're not being able to force pharma right now to let go of the technology to allow um, you know, others uh, to be able to produce medicines and vaccines and masks and to have you know, global access to it in the moment of this emergency, I'm not sure what's gonna happen with this treaty and these negotiations as we go down the, the lane. Uh, you know, Sibinile was talking about how TAC mobilized um, uh, around the German embassy to try and pressure Germany and ask them why they were opposing the TRIPS waiver and to get them to back down. Uh, if we're not going to be able to move these countries right now, we can just imagine what the what the state of these pandemic treaty negotiations are actually going to be. Um, I think it's true that global solidarity was the most important and the biggest missing factor in this pandemic, whether this treaty which relies on negotiations by developed countries that are thwarting every move our governments and our communities are making to access medicines right now, uh, how they're going to play out in negotiations, international institutions are compromised by their reliance on pharmaceutical companies and private foundations. So yeah, I think I'm a little cynical about how these negotiations will turn out. That's not to say that community groups and health groups should not be engaging with it and ensuring that we try and make sure these negotiations go uh, in the right direction. Um, but but yeah, I, I, I apologize. My cynicism is the overwhelming uh, feeling that I have these days. Um, uh, and, and, you know. No, no problem. I, I mean, I think it's, I smile and I laugh, but I think it's understandable because literally millions of people are dying and since October 2020 we're still debating whether there should be a waiver for COVID-19 so exactly yeah yeah uh so I see Leslie has posted a chat question and I still don't see Sivongile in the room so I'm going to take Leslie's question which I think is for Kajal and then uh, I'm, I'm going to throw open the, the other questions that uh, Temi Celia posted to some of the other activists in the room. I think we have tech members, I think we have community health workers in the room. And so we can just, I think, collectively reflect on those questions. Um, but hopefully also in that time, Sibongile comes back. So Leslie wanted to know, how do we change the narrative out there um, that the heroes of vaccine development are big pharma and, and they're going to save us all? And that if we um, uh, change the IP laws, then um, pharma companies won't invent these life-saving medications that we ultimately need. Yeah. Uh, oh, I see Simbol Sibungile is back. Maybe I'll quickly answer this one uh, and then hand it back to uh, Sibungile. You know, I think, um, so, I, you know, that COVAX description actually came from uh, from, from the, the, the Special Envoy of Africa. And, and it was, you know, for, for many of us who had this really bad feeling about COVAX from the beginning, it was a brilliant explanation of exactly the, the magician's trick that was played on the whole world with this, uh, with this initiative being set up. I think the question on changing the narrative, I think there's, you know, there is pushback. It's not like there isn't. If you see in certain kind of questioning media, I think there is the, the voices of communities of our international campaigns, our regional national campaigns, they are getting through. Um, you know, there is a very strong sense across the world that what is happening right now is unbelievably unfair, particularly when there is a solution to it and you can have much more, more production. Um, I think the question is, how do you mobilize around that and push it? Uh, there was something from the, the People's Vaccine Alliance recently, which basically said that the Pfizer BioNTech scientists have been, you know, nominated for the, for the Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, I think there would be a bigger slap on the face of the access to medicines movement if they get that, that, that Nobel Peace Prize, because guess what? The science is old on mRNA. The, the pandemic just gave them the opportunity to make the vaccine, to deploy it. And yes, it is life-saving and yes, it is important. But if as scientists and a company, you're going to sit on the technology and not share it, um, that, you know, that is a huge problem. So, so you're right. That's a very strong, overwhelming narrative that is coming out. It is being pushed by developed countries. Um, but I don't think that it's true that mainstream media is not also carrying the critique. I think it is there. I think it's for us to really think of more creative ways of getting it out there. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic took out 
one of the biggest uh, you know strengths that that mobilizations and communities have which is getting on the streets you know between lockdowns and not going out and all that that is one of the things we've missed and i think one of the things we're struggling with is how to strategize in a situation where you have to be a box on a computer screen to discuss uh, you know what, what how do we change the world um so i think we have to really think about what to do in the next uh, two years I, i know that's not a great answer but yes i think this hero image has to stop um just for those of you who don't know when the wto strips agreement was actually adopted pfizer at the time came out with a one page advertisement in the economist taking credit for the chips agreement saying that for 30 years they had worked with the us government to push global patent rules on all of us and pfizer is today getting its absolute you know profit and dessert from that billions of dollars so yeah we have to do everything possible to make sure that they don't come out as heroes on this because they really are not um so yeah maybe hand back to sibong dile for the question for her thanks kajo So I see uh, Simon Gile you're back in the room. Uh well since I see that your hand is up but I'm going to just ask Denisile's question again which was to Simon Gile. So the one question was um around education what are the the main lessons from the HIV AIDS treatment struggle uh that that we can apply to the COVID-19 vaccine education process. So that's the one. The other one um was about corruption and greed. in in government and the fact that corruption within the department of health is really a uh, part of the reason why the health system is collapsing and and what is tech doing around that is there a, a program of ex- action and then the final question has to do with um vaccines versus taking medication or pills orally and and melanie can have helped to explain this in in the chat so i think the question is uh do you think that there's a, a hesitation around vaccination because it means going to get injected with a needle and i mean who likes that so so do you think uh, when you've spoken to people that there would be more openness um to kind of taking an an oral contraceptive for covid-19 as it were um versus a, a vaccine so simonilia the floor is yours thanks i'm glad you could get back in Thank you Lauren. Uh I'm sorry my 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 uh, I'm sorry my 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 network was bad on my side. Yeah, it's windy here. Yeah, I'm in Pumalanga and the network is not very good. Um firstly let me talk about education as an information sharing as uh, I, I I spoke about it earlier in my presentation to say yes I think what we have learned uh, in a in HIV area is that people when you give them information they can they take more informed decisions uh, for us to get more people on to treatment it's because they were taught and they were given time to think about it and that's why it was easy for people to take informed decision so that is a lesson that we took from the hiv uh, time to now to say now we have covid-19 and for people to understand vaccine because what we are getting on the ground is that people are more are more uh, uh, um, understanding what they are getting on social media and the fake news that are always shared on social media they don't and most of the time it's it's word of mouth when somebody hears somebody says anything and then that somebody will take it as if something has happened next to to the family or somebody next to that person and information is very inf- important just to share a, 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 a a practical experience uh three weeks back we had a, 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 a national sector summit in, within TAC and we had session the first day we had session on covid-19 vaccines what actually we started to say what is covid and we taught people and we had a session on covid-19 uh, uh, vaccines and at the end of uh, of the session out of out of 80 people who were there 22 people who were not vaccinated before the end of the week they were vaccinated so you can you and this shows the power of information and explaining and giving people exact information 
but let us simplify it. Remember that not everyone is a doctor, not everyone is an activist who can understand these languages, uh, the scientific ways that uh, we are using. But if you explain it better and give yourself time to explain to communities, I believe that more people will take vaccine. And information uh, sharing, it always give a, a chance to people to be able to take informed decisions. When we talk about corruption and greed, I think that we've been talking about for a very long time. And everyone in this webinar will agree with me to say, we are in this crisis because of corruption. A lot of things never happened because of corruption. Posts were, were frozen long before uh, COVID-19. Now people are coming and blaming COVID-19. COVID-19 has nothing to do with what the, the broken healthcare system that we are facing. We started to call the government to fix the broken healthcare system since 2012 as treatment action campaign. And today it has just exposed COVID-19, it has just exposed the government to say they were not listening to what to us and they were not fixing what we are they were supposed to fix. And all this time, we know that in, in some programs, government never uh, spent uh, rightly and they, when they were underspending on other programs, we saw the 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 audit report that shows that there is a lot of corruption that is happening, especially in the Department of Health. So the greed of our leaders and what we leaders that we are electing, that is why we need to make sure that we always hold them accountable. What are we planning to do as treatment action campaign or what we have been doing? We have not been keeping quiet. Keeping quiet. We've been pushing. Remember, we are part of, 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 um, the Katani Matangu era when we were calling Katani Matangu to be removed as, a, as an MEC and to be arrested for kill, killing people in, in life city men. We've been talking about a uh, brown strong ones who stole money from 2009, who were not uh, taken to justice. Now we are seeing more leaders uh, 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 being uh, implicated in corruption and we will not keep quiet. Even the case of Zuelim Kize, we were the first one to say Zuelim Kize must uh, be suspended, must step aside and allow uh, 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 um, all the, the, the necessary uh, uh, the, uh, procedures to take place so that he, he might not interfere with them. So we are continuing to call the ones who are stealing from the public press to be arrested. Now, as I'm talking to you, we are having a meeting with the national leadership of TAC this afternoon uh, to talk about the next step of what are we going to do now that we've learned that more, more people were, are implicated on the digital vibes uh, saga. So we will not keep quiet you will see TAC on the streets very soon and we will demand that all these thieves, these criminals should be uh, uh, brought to justice, not only forcing them to pay back the money, but they need to be arrested. In South Africa, we have a constitution that says we are all equal in the face of the law. So if you have stolen from the public purse, then you need to serve your sentence in jail like everybody. When you talk about issues of oral and, and versus, versus uh, vaccines, I think both they need edu education. Remember, ARVs were not taken uh, as a vaccine, were taken orally. But we have lost so many people because they were misinformed about ARVs by our government, by the, 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 the so-called quack doctors, that the Leomitheus rat, who were misleading people to say, if you take a, a, a antiretrovirus, there will be cause toxicity in your liver, you will die and all those things. So we have lost so many people because they were misinformed. So even today, whether vaccines or orally, I don't think it will make a difference. What, would, what will make a difference is to give people right information at the right time and make sure that we explain it thoroughly. Don't just put a, a place, a, a, the posters that say where your marks vaccinate without more uh, information. People need to be more informed. People need to be engaged because people have to take a, a, a informed decision at the, at the end of the day. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Simongile. Um, I saw earlier that Wilson's hand was up. Wilson, do you want to come in now with your question? No, okay. So I'm just um, checking the chat. I don't see any new questions in the chat. Uh, oh, the Temisile then is up. Temisile. Hello. 
Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Do you hear me? Oh, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, my is to thank you to, to the speakers first. Uh, well articulated, very well. And uh, this is uh, an activism that we, we need to be display on the ground. Uh, to you, Kaja, uh, I want to welcome your presentation. Also to, to, to understand that the, the, the issue of IP uh, intellectual property is, is not an easy one. As you alluded to the fact that you, in your presentation, uh, we cannot rely to, 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 to the government in, in doing things. Uh, that raises to me a question that during this time of pandemic, uh, across globally. I, I know that as South Africa is a part of AU and there was a hot discussion, a plan to, to, to have the African pharmaceutical company in terms of producing their own medication, not to depend to, to the other countries like UK, et cetera, and USA. So do you tell me that uh, as the team that working through this IP, not supporting that initiative, or if you supporting that initiative, what plans are in place in terms of that, uh, uh, or what benefits, what benefits that we can gain as African countries when that has been built and functionally. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Timbasile. I, I, that's a, it's a difficult question to answer because it is about local production and, and self-reliance, but I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, I think the African Union had an excellent pharmaceutical production plan uh, that was debated, discussed, and has been in place for many years. Um, and, and if you go through the plan, it's, it's a really good plan about, it looks at education of, of, you know, having scientists and engineers based in the African Union itself, of setting up local production facilities, ensuring that intellectual property was not going to be a barrier. So, you know, all the elements that you would need to set up your, your local industry. If we look at the history of Brazil, of Thailand, of India, uh, and now Bangladesh, you know, all these these uh, um, um, centers for medicines production have emerged in a situation where intellectual property wasn't a problem. The problem today is that the TRIPS agreement, um, uh, you know, it's, it's over 20, 25 years old now, uh, really entrenches those barriers in our country's laws. And even though this plan has been in action, not many countries across the African Union actually changed their laws to bring in the flexibilities to allow for production. The other thing that happened was in countries like Uganda, which actually have set up local production facilities. Uh, there was this big question that what was locally produced um, was, was too expensive. And the imports that were coming in from India were cheaper, so why don't we just rely on the imports? Uh, and the problem with that argument you see today. Um, so even if your local manufacturing is going to be more expensive, we have to think about how to take funds so that patients and governments are not paying that cost, your health ministries aren't paying that cost, but it's so crucial to be self-reliant on local production, um, make sure that you're not reliant only on imports, because this is the exact sort of situation that arises, um, you know, and, and we are looking at future pandemics coming down the lane and, and of course, treatment for other things. So I know I'm not giving you a straight answer. But I think local production has been on the menu of activists for a very long time. I think we have to use the pandemic to push and say this situation can never arise again, uh, where we're dependent and beholden on a few companies who are literally deciding who lives and dies with absolutely no accountability. 
Uh, and the only way we can deal with that is take back some control, at least, on how things are produced. If every country can't do it, there should be regional production. Uh, there is an mRNA vaccine hub that the WHO is trying to set up in South Africa. Again, they're stuck because the companies are refusing to share the technology. The one thing we have to remember as activists and tell our governments is that this is not a short-term project. Okay, you're not going to get a, a company, a factory up and running and immediately have uh, high quality product, products flowing out of it. You know, this is a five-year project. This is a 10-year project. It's a 20-year project. But we have to start investing in it now um, because, you know, we keep going around in circles and then it is 20 years later and then we're stuck. In 2001, the exact same conversation happened about the manufacturing of ARVs in Africa. And here we are 20 years later saying, what happened to that conversation on local production? Why wasn't it funded? Why didn't the international agencies support it? Why did we start looking at the economics of cheaper imports versus uh, sustainable local production? You know, so I think we have to start asking those questions. And my one worry is that, you know, as more and more people get vaccinated and as the, the force of the pandemic slows down, the pressure for these conversations will disappear. And it will be up to us as activists to keep that pressure up of saying we cannot be in this situation uh, you know, ever again. So not a great answer, but, uh, but just a few things to think about. Thanks, Kaja. So there's a, a question from Jabuli Sile in the, the chat. Um, so uh, that's about the 10 plus one lessons that you highlighted. And he wants to know how successful do you think civil society campaigns have been based on these takeaways that you that you highlighted um, from the HIV AIDS access movement? Um, Janine has asked if we have a pandemic treaty, how will that be enforced? How will people be kept accountable? So maybe what I'll do, since we have about two minutes left, I'll ask you to think about those in terms of a kind of big final statement. Uh, and, and then the same, um, to Sibongile to ask, uh, you, you know, you've, you've highlighted that, yes, the, um, the big lesson around uh, education is one of the things that comes through clearly um, when we look at lessons from HIV for COVID-19, but perhaps Sibongile, as part of your closing statement, um, what do you think maybe the, the, the things are that we should pay more attention to this time that we may be uh, blind spots that we had during the HIV AIDS struggle around the demand for access to medicines and the demands around healthcare systems. Um, what did we maybe miss um, that, that really this time we shouldn't miss if we want to build, build back, as people say, um, a, a, a better health system that really can promote health for all. So I'm going to ask Kajal to go first and then Sibongili, you have the last word. I'll just make one quick comment on the question of the pandemic treaty. How will it be enforced and, and what will we do? I mean, you know, if it is a legal treaty, there will hopefully be legal enforcement mechanisms. But, you know, if we see the kind of nationalism and vaccine nationalism that came into play this time around, and I'm pretty sure some of that will get negotiated into the treaty, um, it's a big question. Uh, and I agree it's an important one that we could all sign on the dotted line as governments and countries, but who's actually going to enforce it um, uh, when the time comes? Um, but that's a larger question. But I'm going to get back to the, the, the other question on, on you know, how, what have we managed as communities uh, till now? Uh, and looking at the, the vaccine, uh, the people's vaccine, uh, you know, I think the people's vaccine poll that came out from UNE is right in the beginning. I think this is a really important one to focus on, 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 on what we really needed in the moment. Um, and I think the, the alliance has come up with really interesting analysis. Uh, you know, the, the, the slide that I had on, on the profits that the companies are making, looking at the thing, you know, the, the data that's flowing into how communities can challenge what's going on. It's been important. But I think one of the things is that there's a bit of a feeling that because these are large international campaigns, they feel a bit top down. Um, and I think one of the things that Sibulia really spoke about, and we've seen it in the Asia Pacific region as well, is that one, communities are really struggling with the pandemic and the lockdown the economic losses, the, the, you know, the, the mental health of many of their of community members, particularly when it comes to sex workers who've lost their livelihoods completely, uh, drug users who are in prison. You know, it, it's a whole massive uh, fallout from, from the pandemic. Um, but one of the things that they've also really been talking about is treatment literacy on the ground. And we know that even when it comes to challenging intellectual property, the single biggest factor has been community literacy and mobilization. Um, so I think it's not enough for us to have the conversations at the international level or in regional things or even in webinars like this. It is Sibongile's primary question 
how do we take that information? How do we simplify it? How do we um, make it, you know, put it in such a way where you can actually take the treatment literacy lessons from the HIV pandemic and apply it now to COVID and of course to everything else, including broken healthcare systems. Uh, and I think that is the biggest challenge. So if we want the movement to come from the ground up, the only way that happens is if communities are empowered. Uh, and I think in that, there has probably been a bit of a gap in, in how we've gone around the activism uh, you know, for the last year and a half. I think people have done their best. It's been really, really hard. There's been a mainstream media and a developed country machine that has functioned, a pharmaceutical lobby machine that has functioned. And given that, I think the campaigns have done extremely well. But I think our big challenge is what Sigundila has said, and that's why I leave it up to her, is uh, that these movements have to be bottom up. Uh, and we really have to think about getting past um, you know, slick, slick advocacy, which we got really good at. Uh, there's really good creative posters out there. You know, we're all used to doing this. Um, but community mobilization and literacy is always the key. As old-fashioned as that may sound, that's the key uh, to it. Uh, yeah. Um, Lauren, I, I think uh, 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 Kajal just covered me well to say uh, as much as community mobilization was happening due to due the, to from the era of HIV and and as we learned from it and continuously we keep on learning so we need to get everyone involved irrespective where you are coming from the background and, and anything so we couldn't miss this this any that that this time so everyone needs to get involved everyone needs to be informed everyone needs to be mobilized that is why we need well, that is why I keep on talking about more information. But also, we need to remember that uh, COVID-19, it's one of the pandemics that are coming. And when you read and you learn, is we learn that there are more pandemics that are, are, are coming. So how do we keep ourselves ready? How do we make sure that by the time we face other pandemics, we are ready as, as countries, as communities, to say, how are we going to deal with it, with this? But also, you know, what thing that we are not learning from are fake news that keep uh, continuous coming on to say, how are we preventing them? And how are we, are we sensitizing our communities or have uh, information hubs that are accurate where the community may go and, 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 and verify information that they are getting? Like, for instance, in the era of HIV, we had a lot of myths, long fake news and more and misinformation. And even now, we still have the very same thing. So we need to learn from that to say we cannot continuously have uh, something like that. So I think as civil society, also, we need to think of information hub where anything and everything that talks to anything that we know that this is true, and we put it on that on that uh, hub where everybody can be able to access that uh, site or whatever to verify each and every information or sometimes just click and put what you have heard and there is some uh, a back uh, a chatting space space where somebody will respond to say no this is not true based on this information and give information to people i think what we can do and we need to do moving forward and every day is to be informed now and again and make sure that everyone is in, is, is informed. Thank you very much. Thanks, Simongile. I like that idea of information hubs so that, that people have a place to go to when they, when they need reassurance or they need to know, you know is this right or wrong. Um, so I can see, Wilson, that your hand is up, but unfortunately we're out of time. So if you want, you can try and put the question in the chat and maybe the speakers will be able to, to answer it uh, in the closing minutes or seconds of the, the webinar. I want to say thank you very much to Sibumile and Kajo. I think it's been a really good discussion. It's a bit depressing to come back to the same conversation every 20 years, but it's like Sibumile said, maybe, maybe it will finally sink in that this is not the last a global pandemic or the last health threat that will come. And of course we need the medicines, but in order to get the medicines to the people, we also need um, solidarity, education at community level, but also health systems that work uh, and health systems that actually care for the hands of the nurses and the community health workers and the doctors that administer the medicines when they come. So, Thank you to both the speakers. Um, thank you to everyone who attended for the questions and the comments. 
Um, there will be a, a recording that's shared of this and little snippets of the webinar will also be made. Uh, and then I also want to encourage everyone to um, attend the webinar series that's being advertised at the moment. So it's something PHM is doing in collaboration with Health Justice Initiative and African Alliance. Uh, and there's four webinars organized around the themes of greed, divides, and solidarity. And it looks at the fact that the African continent uh, basically has, um, compared to the rest of the world, almost no access to vaccines. Uh, it's about, I think, three to five percent of the continent that's been vaccinated so far, and that compares to over 60 percent in many countries in the global north. Um, and so this other webinar series tries to look at why that's the case but also how we can mobilize to change that dynamic so thank you everyone uh hoping that the rest of your day goes well and take care please mm -hmm.